Hey everyone, I'm Ron Johnson, and this is the Ron Johnson Show on Locked On Sports Minnesota. The Steel Curtain. Was there issues with the Steel Curtain? Like, were they always not the man of steel or the men of steel? I don't know. Mel Blunt's going to tell us about that and his thoughts on Doug Williams and black quarterbacks in the NFL coming up next on the Ron Johnson Show. Locked On Sports Minnesota Podcast. It's endless Minnesota Vikings talk with the diverse voices of your local experts. Now the Ron Johnson Show. On the field, in the broadcast booth, Ron Johnson is Minnesota sports. He's played with them, hung out with them, and grown up with all the big names in Minnesota sports. They're hanging out with Ron Johnson. It's the Ron Johnson Show on the Locked On Sports Minnesota podcast. And it starts now. Welcome to the Ron Johnson Show, and I'm your host, Ron Johnson. I want you to know this episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every minute more. Make sure you're locked on to the bets. Visit FanDuel.com backslash Locked On today to get started. And how do you get started? Hey, just go on, put about 10 bucks in there. There's an offer. Check it out. You'll get some money back from FanDuel Sportsbook to put money down. It's not easy. But those parlays, so much more fun. They make every single game a little bit more exciting. I know it was for me with the Timberwolves and Orlando. We'll talk about that at some point this week because it didn't go my way. But the fight went the Timberwolves way. But also, I want you guys to make sure you know, Mel Blunt is coming up. He's going to sit down in the Hangover Ron Johnson segment. I'm super excited about this. Mel Blunt uh, was there when I was born. Uh, him and my dad were best friends, lived a couple houses down from each other. So he was always at our house. Uh, he was one of the guys that would play uh, catch with me every day. I mean, I was like one and two years old. I'm watching old home videos and diapers and I'm playing catch with a balloon. And so I guess I can thank Mel Blunt for my hands uh, because he took the time. Him and my dad would take the time to play catch with me every day before they went to practice, after practice. And so as I'm older now and I watch home videos, I, I look back and I start to realize uh, how much Mel was in my life, and he's still in my life to this day. Uh, so I'm excited to get him on the show uh, to just tell some memories, talk about the NFL, where it's going now, his thoughts on Justin Jefferson. He's going to give us that as well. And remember, you can find Locked On Sports Minnesota on Amazon Fire and Roku. Just download the Locked On Sports Minnesota app to get all your favorite shows. Well, let's hang out with Ron Johnson. And uh, this one is special for me. This is a, a guy that I grew up uh knowing because of my dad one of his teammates uh but also it's super bowl week so it's kind of dual purpose get some some super bowl conversations in there uh but pittsburgh steelers man if you if you know the steel curtain if you think about this the 70s and and how they dominated football uh when you talk about the greatest uh defenses of all time i played with a guy by the name of ray lewis and ed reed and i know they quote unquote, you know, might think their defense was the best. You think the Bears from the 85 team, but I think Mel Blunt has something to say about the Steelers team, and he's going to join me uh, and hang on Ron Johnson segment. Uh, Mel, I want to thank you uh, for joining me and taking time out of your busy uh, schedule. Uh, for those that don't know, my dad played for the Pittsburgh Steelers. He was drafted to the Steelers in 78. Mel Blunt was his teammate. And as a baby, all I heard about was how hard. You know, Mel Blunt worked, how hard the defense was on people. Uh, I remember Mel used to tell me that, you know, oh, receivers are soft. We would have beat you guys up at the line of scrimmage and making it easy. Uh, but I want to I thank you for joining, joining me, man, because I've always uh, admired you. I've always been thankful of, of the, the time you've always given me when I needed it. And I'm really appreciative uh, when my dad passed away, you know, without without even thought you were there. I don't even think we reached out to you. Just, you know, you and a lot of the teammates showed up. Uh, so I appreciate appreciate you for that as well. But uh, just just tell me a little bit though about uh, Mel Blunt, the Cowboy, because you always have had the hats. I grew up knowing about you know because Tanisia uh, was always like I see home videos now of a kid and Tanisia is in the video and you, my mom, my dad, you know me, we're all like playing around in the living room. I'm jumping off walls. Uh, Tanisia is sitting there, I don't know, drinking a Slurpee or something, and she's getting on everybody's nerves, but. Where, when, where did the cowboy phase start for you? Hey, well, first of all, Ron, let me just say what an honor <laughs> it is to be here and to see you, man. Just uh, I'm, I'm so proud of you. Uh, as you mentioned, I, 
I, I used to hold you in my lap as a little <laughs> kid, man. I remember the day you was born and, and uh, how your dad and I were the best of friends and our families. So you're like family to me. And um, but but let me just back up a minute. Uh, you know, your dad was just an outstanding uh, ball player, first round draft choice in 1978 and really helped us to win uh, those other two Super Bowls. We had won two before he got there. And it's it's unusual for a rookie to come in and uh, start and go and win a championship. So that's the kind of player your dad was. And, uh, you know, it, it was only fitting that um, everyone showed up uh, at his film because he was a part of our family. And but as far as the cowboy hat, look, I grew up on a farm in Georgia, man. I, I I've always, um, you know, uh, we had horses and mules and, you know, and I'm a lot older than you. And I, I tell young people this because I grew up doing segregation in the South. And, uh, you know, we didn't have uh, we didn't have trucks and cars and it was all mules, wagons, sleds. And that's that's kind of the way we we rolled uh, growing up on a farm. And then uh, in 1970, when I was drafted, I started uh, really getting into the horses and and showing and competing and i've been doing that ever since but it, it's a great way of life my my son uh he's heavily involved in showing horses and i try to expose all our kids that we have here at the youth home just the love of the animal and and the therapeutic side of it and what great animals they are because when you think about the horse there's nothing there's no other animal that can carry man on this their back as fast and as far as a as a horse so it's a special animal and uh, i'm just glad that uh, as a child i was exposed to that life and uh, i cherish it today at, at the age 75 man i'm still enjoying it yeah and, and how often i mean because now yes yeah, it's 75 how often are you out there still on the horses every day oh every, man I, every day uh show on weekends and uh it's just a, it's just a way of life it's it's part of my dna and I passed that on. Uh, my father passed it on to me, and I'm passing it on to my kids. And you know, my grandkids ride. Uh, we got kids, uh, inner city kids that come and stay with us here at the farm. They ride. It, it's just a it's just a good way of life, and it's a good way of, of getting to know who you are and learning how to respect life and respect animals and and have a great appreciation for what uh, life is all about. Yeah, I know my eight-year-old loves horses for some reason. All of a sudden, so I might have to, I might have to take you up on that one of these weekends. Bring her down there and uh, get on the horses. You need to do that, man. Come on, I will. Out. Us out. I will. So, uh, thinking about you know, you you bought up cornerbacks, rookies starting. You know, you played early as well. Um, the Minnesota Vikings had a similar situation. They have Patrick Peterson, veteran, you know, future Hall of Famer. So kind of like the male blunt of the Minnesota Vikings. And then year after year, they've had to draft, you know, first round, second round, uh, third round cornerbacks. And none of them have kind of really solidified uh, and, and mainly because of injury. But how hard is that for, because people just think, oh, you know what? He was great in college. He's going to come in and be great in the NFL. How hard is that for a cornerback uh, to transition to that speed of game? Well, I think it's I think it's difficult, and I also think at that position you got to be one of the better, if not the best, athlete on the team, because uh, you know you got a guy running at you uh, four three speed, and you're running backwards. Then you got to stop and turn and react. Um, it, it's difficult, but I I think that's in today's game uh, you got to have great cover guys because they're throwing the ball so much. And it's your size six four, like that's not normal. Cause uh, you know, I always joke with people. I'm like, oh yeah, Mel Blunt was six four, and they're like, no, he, he's no way. That's that's the <laughs> NFL lies about stats. And then you know, we finally got to take a chance to take a picture. As I'm older, cause I'm like six three and a quarter, right. and we took a picture together. And you are legit six four. And so, what? How did that help you being a six four cornerback, especially in that day and age when you know it was the five tens, the five elevens, the you know the six feet corners, and you come in at six four. Well, Ron, you know, I, I was kind of an outlier because, uh, number one, I could run. I had speed. I, you know, I ran a 4-4 four, four 
and run a four four back in the seventies. That was, <laughs> you know, pretty good speed. Oh yeah. I had uh, my wingspan. You know, I had I had reach and I could cover, uh, and I you know had quick feet. So I was kind of an unusual guy for my size, but then I had good ball skills and uh, I love contact. And so, uh, you know, when, when I played, you know, I wanted to get up and challenge guys. I, I you know, because look, when I came out of college, uh, Emmett Thomas, uh, uh, Mar Jimmy Marcellus, all these guys, Kansas City had just won uh, the Super Bowl. They had mm -hmm. beat Soda down in New Orleans in 1969. Uh, and so those were the guys who I emulated my game after. I wanted to get up. I wanted to be physical. I wanted to, you know, make sure guys can get off, get a clean release off the line of scrimmage. And so that really led to them changing uh, the rules and, and really naming that rule the Mel Blunt rule, which – at the time, I was a little bit insulted. I'm like, oh, so you guys think I can't play no other kind of way. And then we went on and won two more Super Bowls. But now in my older age, my kids, my grandkids, they think that's the coolest thing. Man, Dad and Papa, they got a rule named after you. You know, so you, it, it just goes to show you, man, when you when you lay your talent out there and, and you be who you are, you, you'd be surprised. Uh, what you can do. And, and what I see in today's game is, is uh, great athletes out there on the corner, but I don't see them really challenging the receivers. You know, they're giving guys 10 yards, 12 yards space. Well, my goodness, you know, it's kind of like pitch and catch. Mm -hmm. uh, but if a guy has enough courage to get up there and challenge somebody and make them work for what they get and uh, reroute them, by times for the pass rush, all these things work together when you play in a team sport. So uh, at that position, I still say you got to have great athletes uh, and they got to be some of the best, if not the best athletes on the field. And they got to be willing to go out there and challenge people. Plenty more to come with Mel Blunt. Let me take a quick moment and tell you about FanDuel, America's number one sports book and the new partner here at Locked On. Download FanDuel now so you can bet Super Bowl 57. No sweat first bet. Get up to $3,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. It's the last football game of the season. Get in on the action at FanDuel. Money lines, point spreads, props, all of the above. The FanDuel Sportsbook app is safe, secure, and easy to use, and you get paid instantly after you win. So join FanDuel today at FanDuel.com slash locked on. Claim your no sweat first bet on Super Bowl 57. FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more. Yeah, when you think about today's top receivers, you know, Justin Jefferson is doing something that no other receiver has done in NFL history. You know, I think 4,900 yards or 4,800 yards in three seasons, so on and so forth. But when you think about a guy like Justin Jefferson, he's never faced uh, like a 6'4 physical guy like yourself. And and now he kind of dances off the line of scrimmage because like you're saying, the rules have changed. Uh, but if, if you were to put him back in the 70s and a guy dancing off the line of scrimmage like that, like how would you try to combat a Justin Jefferson uh, so they can't get fully going into his route. Well, they had a lot of Jeffers, uh, Jeffersons back in the seventies. I mean, they were they were, they had a guy named Kenny Burroughs who mm -hmm. was with the uh, he was the number one pick for the Houston Oilers at the time when when the Oilers were in in Houston. Uh, ran a four three, big guy like six three and a half, and could fly. But those were the kind of guys we played against. The Isaac Curtis's of the world. Uh, you know, Charlie Jones, these guys, uh, you know, Charlie's a Hall of Famer. Paul Warfield is a Hall of Famer. So nothing is new what you're seeing in the NFL. What's different is the rules are different, which allows these guys to be able to have the numbers a lot better. You know, you think about a guy like John Starworth and mm -hmm. Lynn Swan, who played in an era where they wasn't throwing the ball a whole lot. And they were the rules, the, the, dip, the defenses were it wasn't handicapped like they are today. So it made it more difficult for guys to perform and, and be productive. So what I look at when I see the NFL today, I say, okay, this is a new game. Uh, you got great athletes out there playing it, but we had great athletes when we played, but the rules were different. 
Yeah, no, it, it, and I know the defense is they're now looking at the the hip drag rule, and you can no longer you know grab a guy like a lion grabs a, a, a antelope and bring him to the ground because. We saw Patrick Mahomes get hurt. We saw Tony Pollard with the Cowboys get hurt. And it's always a big-time player. It takes a big-time player to get hurt for the NFL to look at it, Patrick Mahomes being one of the biggest. We remember the horse collar rule friend of mine, Roy Williams. He came on the show, and you know they created that rule because of him. He horse collar tackled Terrell Owens, broke his leg. T.O. came back in the Super Bowl, but the NFL was like, man, we missed a, a half of a season of no T.O. because of this tackling, so we have to take this out of the game. So uh, it's getting more and more like they're trying to handicap the defense even more, and and that's where it's headed. Um, but, but you, you know, you brought up some big-time names, you know, back in the 70s, and, and again, I've, I've heard them all. Uh, the one thing I wish I would have done as a younger kid was pay more attention because, honestly, like – Lynn Swan, for instance, worked for ABC. He covered my game. Minnesota played Michigan, and he was the reporter and, and, and play-by-play guy. And I didn't really, you know, spend a whole ton of time. I went over there. I talked to him. You know, my dad was like, yep, that's Lynn. And Lynn, and I knew Lynn, and you know that. And But, you know, I didn't relish it like I do now at the age of 42. I look back like, man, like, those are some great conversations. And, you know, talking to Franco at, at my dad's funeral and talking to me and Joe Green. And now at this age, I really relish those and, and enjoy those conversations. Uh, but when you're looking at uh, that time, and the, let's go back to the Oilers, for instance. When you look at some of those games, like one of the moments I'll always remember, because, of course, it's all over social media, is the Oilers receiver catches the ball in the corner end zone, just happens to be my dad getting beat. I, I teased him all, all the time about it. But they called him out of bounds. Um, right. you know, in your, in your thoughts on that moment, like all those kind of moments, like one, do you really think the Oilers guy was out of bounds or, cause I know the joke was like, oh, they, they called and see, could they get enough cops down there to, uh, protect the refs if they gave the Oilers that game? Well, look, I, I remember that play and, uh, I think we all agreed that the guy was out of bounds. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way we saw it. But there were, there were great, there were great moments throughout. You know, I played 14 years in the NFL, and 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 people always say, "Well, what was your what was your greatest uh, memory or your greatest game? All those games are your greatest challenge. Or who was the toughest? You know, all these qu- all these questions. And there was no there were no easy outs, mm-hmm. and, and there were no easy comp- opponents. Every every Sunday that you lined up out there, you had to bring your best because. Number one, that's just the way the NFL is. And number two, when you're when you're a champion, then everybody's gunning for you. They're bringing their best game. Um, I think um, you know the Oilers. Uh, you know we we had we had great competition. I'm talking about Cincinnati, even Cleveland, the Browns, and 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 even today. You know, you talk to guys today, they'll tell you, man, it, it might look easy sitting on your couch watching these guys, but that's a tough way to make a living. And uh, I think football is is still uh, evolving. Uh, and I say that because we talk about the difference in the uh, the game today versus when I played. Well, when I came in the league, guys was telling me, oh man, it's different now than when we played back in the 50s and 60s. Mm-hmm. So that's just the way the game is. Uh, I saw something this weekend that, uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see uh, the NFL going that way. You know, you look at what they did at the Pro Bowl. They had flag, mm-hmm. and you look at what happened to uh, the kid from Buffalo when he got, you know, got hurt and had to be resuscitated on the field. So, you know, in the NFL, look at all these things. They're, they're thinking about player safety. They're thinking about public opinion. All these things uh, has an effect on the game and what the game might look like in the future yeah and and you brought up a great point you know all the big games you've been a part of uh how the game has changed because now the immaculate reception changed the game like that that's no longer a questionable play no matter who it hits off of as long as it doesn't hit the ground a player can continue but even in that instance because i know frenchy fuqua got a chance to sit down and talk to him uh as well and you know him and franco were joking about it but you know like again you're there for those moments like even in that moment like in your mind, are you like, like he definitely touched it? He didn't touch it. Like I can't believe this happened. Like what's going through your mind? Well, on that particular play, I can honestly say I I saw the hit when Tatum hit uh, Fuqua. I didn't see the catch. What I did see was Franco running with the ball, and 
you know, the, the stands, the sideline, everybody just went crazy. And next thing I know, they, they said it was a touchdown. And really, even though uh, you can look at that play in a lot of different ways. I mean, it went in our favor. But mm-hmm. I, it's one thing I do know, that that particular play changed the trajectory of the Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, the first year we ever had a winning season, uh, and when Franco came and that play happened, uh, Franco was the guy who got us over the top, and every year we were in the playoffs and went on to win four Super Bowls after that. So you never know what play or what game it's going to be, but there's always a defining moment, and I think in all these franchises, it's either going to be for a positive or a negative, and for the Steelers, it was a positive. Yeah, and you talked about that. Franco coming there, uh, you know, my dad coming in, drafted early, able to start. Uh, you had yourself. You had Donnie Shell. You had Jack Lambert, Joe Green, uh, Elsie Greenwood. When you look at a defense like that, you know, Ham and Lambert, nowadays you don't see that because of free agency, because of money, because of players wanting to be stars on their own. Um, like I remember playing with Bart Scott and Ray Lewis, and that was the one thing. Like Bart Scott knew I can't be the man here because Ray's here, so he went to the Jets. Um, right. You know, whereas he could have stayed, take took less money, won a Super Bowl eventually or sooner, maybe even uh, if they stack the defense. You see corners do that all the time now, wanting to leave, not wanting to stay with their guys because they want to be, you know, the guy. They don't want to play alongside a Hall of Famer. But you guys had a lot of Hall of Famers on that. Um, do you think there will ever be a time where players will? look at that formula and say, you know what, maybe I take a little bit less money, but I'm on a great team. Or are we just headed in this direction where it's always going to thin out because so many players want to get paid? Well, I, I don't, I don't think it's going to happen. I think, you know, the game is, uh, there's a lot of money in the game. Guys want to get paid. The careers are short. Mm -hmm. Uh, You can call it selfish or you can call it whatever, but you work so hard to get there. Uh, and when you get there, people want to prove themselves. And when they prove themselves, they want to get paid and they should get paid. So I think with, with the way the game is now, it would be hard to hold a team together like the Steelers did in the 70s. First of all, the, the rules were different. You couldn't go anywhere. Free agency, free agency was uh, non-existent. Mm-hmm. And, and so players had no choice. And so the only choice you had was try to be as, be- as good as you could be and thank God we won those four Super Bowl. We, we had, uh, I think there's nine or maybe 10 Hall of Famers that was on that team that's in the Hall of Fame, along with Chuck Knoll and Dan Rooney and, and even the scout Bill Nunn, who uh, we're celebrating Black History Month. This is something that players should know about Bill Nunn and what, what he meant to the Pittsburgh Steelers and to historical black colleges because he started scouting and going into those colleges, finding guys like myself and Donnie mm-hmm. Shell and L.C. Greenwood, just to name a few, um, that was a part of that uh, championship run that we had in the 70s. But the, but the game, to answer your question, uh, it's going to be hard, in my opinion, to hold that kind of talent and that many great players together because uh, of the way the game is structured. Still more to come with Mel Blunt. We'll get right back to him after I tell you about Built Bar, a delicious treat without the fat and calories. Built Bar is so nutritious for you and so delicious that it defies reason. But I'm telling you, it's legit. 100% real chocolate, incredible flavors like brownie batter, churro, peanut butter brownie, coconut almond, and you can get them in store now. Go to the pharmacy section at Walmart, get a four-bar box, or head on down to Sam's Club in the same area of the store, a 13-bar box. You can get all the flavors, all the nutrition, just four grams of sugar, 17 grams of protein in these Built Bars, also available at Built.com. You can thank me later. And when you look at, you you brought up a great point about Black History Month. One, you know, we're definitely celebrating that. Uh, Black quarterbacks, because now in the Super Bowl, we have two black quarterbacks, first time ever. We saw, you know, your friend Tony Dungy and and, um, uh, Lovey Smith, first two black head coaches. And so we're always getting these firsts uh, when it comes to African-Americans in sports. Uh, But when you look at that, because you play with Tony Dungy, Tony Dungy was a quarterback at the University of Minnesota. That's the only reason why I'm here. Uh, If not for Tony Dungy, I probably would have went to Michigan State or Penn State or something. 
Uh, but Tony told my dad about Minnesota. And so I came here and I loved it, loved my visit. So I ended up committing. But uh, when you look at Tony Dungy having to go play safety, you know, you look at Warren Moon having to go to Canada, you look at Damon Allen uh, never getting a chance and always having to be in Canada and play and not the NFL, never really considering him an NFL caliber quarterback because one five ten. Uh, but now you see guys like Kyler Murray, Jalen Hurts, guys, you know, six feet and under uh, that are getting their opportunity, black or white. Um, but when you look at the black quarterback uh, and you talk about uh, you, the scout for the Steelers, what is it going to take for eventually, you know, that to change? Because even Lamar Jackson, I mean, that's recent. And Bill Polian said, oh, Lamar Jackson's a running back. And now he's one of the top quarterbacks in the NFL. Jalen Hurts, same thing. They're like, oh, I don't know if he can ever lead a team. And now he's the, the, one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL. Uh, why, why has it taken so long for the black quarterback to get to where they are? Well, that's a good question. I think a lot of it had, has to do with, uh, you know, racism, people's perspective uh, on on uh, African-American men being leaders. Uh, and I think uh, just to back up, I, I sent an a, uh, email to the commissioner talking about, you know, February being Black History Month and mm -hmm. the NFL is making history in February by having two black quarterbacks starting in the Super Bowl. And that how, in my opinion, none of this would be would have been possible had it not been for Doug Williams winning that Super Bowl and him being the first black quarterback to win a Super Bowl. And and uh, and Doug Williams should be recognized in some way or another at the Super Bowl because he was the first black to win a Super Bowl. And also to take it even further, I've been on the Hall of Fame talking about how is it that a guy like Doug Williams is not in the Pro Football Hall of Fame? Because, you know, the Pro Football Hall of Fame's motto is, you know, they want to honor the heroes of the game. They want to preserve its history. They want to promote the values. Then they want to celebrate excellence everywhere. Well, if you want to, if you want to honor the heroes, Doug Williams is a hero. He won the first he was the first black to win a Super Bowl. You know, you want to preserve the history. Well, you can't have a Hall of Fame without that history, without the history of Doug Williams being the first black quarterback to win a Super Bowl. So I've been on that bandwagon. And every time, every opportunity I get to talk about why Doug Williams should be in the Pro Football Hall of Fame and why Doug Williams, like I told the commissioner, should be recognized at this Super Bowl in Arizona because he was the first one to do it. And now here we have two blacks playing in it. And it had not been for him breaking those that that barrier mentally that white folks have about black athletes, and especially in le leadership roles, then that never would have happened. We wouldn't have the Lamar Jackson, and we wouldn't have all these black quarterbacks that we have in the league because – now they see that it's just more than about physical ability. It's about the mental makeup of a man or an athlete and what they're able to do. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And I, and I know the Roonies, you know, they were pushing for African-American head coaches, uh, you know, because guys like Tony Dungy, Romeo Cornell, uh, like Tony Dungy was overlooked time and time again and eventually finally got his chance. Lovey Smith, same thing, finally got his chance. And, and when you look at the Pittsburgh Steelers uh, with a guy like Mike Tomlin, you know, they've only had three – coaches in their entire like that's ridiculous when you look at the number of coaches that keep getting fired from these organizations um but when you look at the Steelers kind of being a blueprint for you don't need to fire a coach just let him work through it because the draft changes players change the league shifts you know power goes here then it comes back here uh and the Steelers have found ways to win Super Bowls you know in every era um, and so looking at that, when you look at the Roonies and, and just the, the things you learn, you know, being with the Steelers, what's one thing like the Roonies and Chuck Noel that, you know, have always stuck with you? Well, I, I admire what the organization stand for. And, um, uh, you know, when you talk about the Steelers, first thing, uh, you know, you, you talk about leadership, the Roonies, the, is, they're a stable family. They are loyal and they believe in giving people a chance. And, and so uh, I think one of the things that I've learned just from watching how they operate, and I try to emulate that in my business and not, not only in my business, but the way I live and the way I 
carry and conduct myself in the community. They're, they're, they're family and community oriented and they believe in working with people, they respect people and they believe in giving opportunities. And that's why you have a Rooney Rule. And that's why, you know, uh, leadership is so important, not just in your family, but in the community and the, what they've been able to do and what they represent and what they stand for as a family in the community is contagious throughout the Pittsburgh uh, community. And so that's why we have such uh, great uh, success with coaches like Tomlin, Bill Cowher, Chuck Noll. You know, when you look at, like you say, around the league, uh, coaches are getting fired every year. Um, um, Sometimes they might not even get a whole year to finish out. And I, it all starts at the top. And I think the Rooners have shown that kind of leadership. And when you think about uh, last two before we get out of here, when you think about the Roonies and, you know, uh, John Stallworth, you know, he had mentioned that he's had an opportunity to buy into the to the organization. And uh, I know more players like LeBron, guys like that, more players are thinking about that. Like, how, how do I get invested in the pro team? Because that seems like it has a return on investment every like it's never going to depreciate, you know, unless the league just implodes, which I don't think ever will happen. Uh, but who knows? Crazy things have happened. Um, but when you look at ownership, because we talk about GMs and now there are some black GMs now in the NFL. Vikings have one in Quasi Adolfo Mensa. Uh, the Titans just hired one. The Bears have Ryan Poles. And so more and more teams are getting uh, black general managers now. And so that's going to, you know, help that when you look at within the building, you look at the, 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 the stigma changing of, oh, I, you know, this guy, I know I can trust this guy to run my organization. I can trust this guy uh, to do this. Do you ever think one of these owners will finally sell to a minority owner? Because I know that's something that's come up a few times where there's no minority ownership, like, like high ownership, not the like minority ownership within an organization, but actually owning a majority of a team. Do you think that's on the horizon? Well, I, I wouldn't put it past uh, that happening. Uh, I don't see it. Uh, but, you know, it really comes down to money. It really comes down to if, if someone is in that position where they have enough resources when, when all the vetting is done by the NFL and they, they think that this guy is, is strong enough financially to, and, and is sustainable, I think that, that it is possible. Uh, and I know there, there are African-Americans out there who are in a position, uh, you know, to pool enough money together uh, as a group to, to uh, go to in front of the NFL and say, hey, we would like to buy this team. The right. problem is uh, who's selling? Nobody's selling. So there's no, there's no teams for sale. But I think if a team came up for sale and there was a legitimate group, minority group that had the financial resources i think they would get a sincere look yeah no and i hope it happens i know uh diddy as well as sean puffy combs has bought it up him and steph curry wanted to buy the panthers when they were up for sale but of course he didn't sell to them um i know lebron has bought it up he wants to buy the cleveland browns or or a team at some point uh because he's heading towards that billion dollar mark as far as his assets and and, and earnings um, Michael Jordan has, has, has talked about, it. I know him and my Rashad when they were up here in Minnesota and my Rashad got, uh, inducted into the purple ring of honor. Jordan had joked around about that as well, not just basketball, but jumping into the football realm. Um, but two more quick ones before we get out of here. One Super Bowl coming up, of course, Eagles chiefs. Do you have any skin in the game? Like, have you thought about it? Like who's going to win this game and, and come out victorious? Well, I don't have any skin in the game, but I, <clears throat> I'm excited. Number one, that we have two African American quarterbacks, and uh, as a as a guy on the outside looking in, I can't lose. Whoever wins, you know, I, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be excited. But just just looking at what I saw doing the playoff runs, um, you know, you can't help but be impressed with what the Eagles have done and what they're doing on defense and. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not predicting them to win. I just know that uh, it's going to be a it's going to be a game worth watching, and uh, I'm going to see what happens. And uh, I'm sure that none of us are going to be disappointed. And there's one quick story though. I do I did want to bring up um, at, at the funeral. I, I forgot who told it. I don't know if it was you or somebody told it, but you guys were playing the Lions. Billy Sims, uh, you know, was running all over you guys. And I don't know if it was Lambert was going for the tackle or him. And my dad 
tried to hit Billy Sims and hit one of them, uh, and you were out there on the field. Explain what transpired in that situation going against Billy Sims. Well, you know, obviously that guy was a special player. And um, if I remember correct, we played them on a Thanksgiving day in Detroit, and we'd never played a Thanksgiving game. And, uh, you know, we just it, – it was one of those games where – we just wasn't hitting on all cylinders. And uh, I know your dad, uh, you know, made a couple of tackles. You know, anytime the secondary started making tackles, you know, going wrong up front. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I think your dad your dad said, come on, steel curtain, come on, steel curtain. And then next play, we get a long run. He come back to the hole. He said, steel curtain my ass, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so we got a lot of stories, man, about <laughs> about things that happened in the games. But that your dad was he was a special player and a special guy, man. I mean, there's a lot of Ron Johnson stories, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like him because he was <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Oh, man, that was his favorite phrase, like, my ass. That was, like, <laughs> everything he finished. It was, like, every time I would be tired or yeah. a game or something. Like, I forgot who we were playing. I think we played Purdue, and it was, like, a shootout. I just told, I actually, I just saw Drew Brees at the playoff game because his son is a Justin Jefferson fan. And so Drew Brees and I were talking about this game. I think Drew Brees threw for, like, and it's not my fault. I don't play defense. But Drew yeah. Brees threw for, like, 406 yards or something. Uh -oh. And it was, like, a 40, it was, like, 48 to, to like 52 it was like one of those dumb games where defense was just like non-existent right and i remember my dad i forgot what happened but he said something like some 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 yeah okay i don't know how y'all gonna win games with that all right keep talking all right all right and then i said i, I must have said like i was tired or something i don't know what i said but he's like yeah. all right yeah you're, you're tired my ass and i'm yeah. like what are you like why are you mad at me <laughs> And like I don't play defense, but you know how he was. He he was engaged in every game, and uh, yeah. oh man, like I, I got some funny videos on ESPN even where somehow like he doesn't have a sideline pass. He didn't have like a family sideline pass, but like it's like in the middle of a game, and he's on the Gopher sideline somehow. Like I don't know if like he just said, "Hey, I'm a Super Bowl champion," and blah blah, and Ron's my son, and security yeah. let him down. But like I keep seeing these ESPN like games pop up, and all of a sudden somehow my dad's on the sideline. So yeah, he was he was always that guy that would just say stuff. But but my ass, that was his. That was one of his favorite and, sayings. And you know what? Play with a lot of intensity, man. I, I tell you what, and it's it's unusual to have a rookie come in and really show the kind of intensity and leadership that he showed. And that, and that's what that, that's what made the Steelers who they were. It wasn't just one guy. We had a lot of guys, man, that just brought so much to the table. And when you have a group of guys like that that's competitive and want to win, they're hard to beat. And when you and last one, if we get out of here, always let guess uh, kind of you know you're you're a player. You've been through a lot. You you've played like I said four Super Bowls. Um, when you look at football, and sorry, and one and one more before we before that, I get to that one because Tom Brady seven Super Bowls. And when you think about, you know, Tom Brady, you got Terry Bradshaw. Um, is that ever got, are we ever going to see quarterbacks get four to seven Super Bowls again? Or is that just, that's, that's hard to do. Well, look, I don't, I really don't know. I just think that with the way they're protecting quarterbacks now, uh, I think that's one of the reasons Tom Brady can play. And, and if you still want to come back out of retirement for the second time, I think <laughs> I, I really do because, you know you can't you can't um, you can't hit the quarterbacks anymore. And then if you tackle them, you got to fall on them a certain way. I right. mean, it, you know. So look, w w way the game is and the way the game is changing. I, you know, none of us know what's out there. None of us know what kind of records are going to be set or how long guys will play. Um, but my hats off to Tom. I think he had a great awesome career uh, the best to ever do it and i just i just hope that uh, the main thing about guys like that man you want guys to be happy and content i mean sometimes it's hard to let go i mean we saw it we saw it with michael jordan we saw it with uh you know a lot of quarterbacks um you know brett Farr. you think about how you know guys just they just hold on but 
I, I would hope that Tom would enjoy what he's accomplished and uh, move on to something else and, and be happy and content with his life. Yeah, and last one before we get you out of here, here's your last one. If you can go back in time at any point in your life and talk to the younger Mel Blunt, uh, what's some advice you would give yourself? Look, uh, I think there are a lot of things um, just looking back. And it's interesting you you asked that question because I was in the gym working out today, man. And I was, you know, I was saying, man, you know, if I would have been a, a lot more mature early in my career, you know, where you, you listen to guys and, uh, you know, you really understand, you know, the moment that you're in. Because, you know, when you get to that level, man, it, it it can leave you so quick. I was fortunate to play 14 years, but there were there would be a lot of things that I would do different. Uh, you know, and one of the things is that I probably would pay more attention to, you know, just the people that I had uh, opportunity to come in contact with, listen more and observe more. And, uh, you know, those, and that that's the hardest when you talk to an athlete and you ask them what they miss, it's the people, the locker room, you know, they, they miss the camaraderie. And when, when we lost Franco during the Christmas holidays, man, it, it was, nothing was driven home to me more than relationships, you know, and whether it was front office people, coaches, you know, because you're on this journey and sometimes we just take things for granted. Uh, and, and so I would definitely try to soak in and be more like a sponge, soak in more knowledge and, and information from guys and people that I ran into in contact with. Well, I want to appreciate you for joining me on the Ron Johnson show coming up next. Me and Sam, are going to dive into a little closing of the show. Uh, but I want to thank you, Mel, for joining me, man. I really appreciate it. You have no idea uh what this meant to me but yeah we're definitely gonna be in contact because i know my daughter she's been talking about horses so always take it as a sign when 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 she brings up horses and all of a sudden wait a minute mel has a farm yeah yeah we, we got to figure this out always proud, proud of you man well thank you well sam that was an awesome interview with mel blunt like i i really enjoyed everything he had to say about his past self because i think when you play 14 years people think that there's no regrets and i loved uh hearing him talk about that with like i wish i had soaked up more and i and we'll we'll have to get them back on again mm -hmm. uh but i'm definitely looking forward to taking my daughter down there because i know she wants to ride horses so i have to figure out how to surprise her with that but i i i wonder who like because he said soak up more so i wonder like what players what people uh because i'm pretty sure in those four super bowl runs there was a ton of stars from back then <laughs> that were like coming to the locker when we think about snoop dogg and guys like that today i'm pretty sure frankie beverly and Mays and whoever who knows earth wind and fire you know we're trying to be around the pittsburgh steelers uh at the super bowl uh but what did you get from the interview man just history um you know you grew up around that dynasty like you you probably knew more going in you knew mel I've never, I've never met Mel before. This is just like eyes wide open for me. Just incredible. This guy that is such a big part of NFL history, a hall of famer, um, four time Super Bowl champion. This guy has seen everything and man, he's sharp. He's got, he remembers everything. Just unbelievable storytelling. Um, that was so much fun. I I'm so glad that you had that connection and brought Mel on. Uh, that was really a treat. Well, I hope everybody enjoyed the show. Like and let us know your thoughts in the comment section. You tell us, what did you like about the Mel Blunt interview? Was there something that he said that really stood out to you? Let us know your comments, whether it's on Instagram, Twitter, or of course, YouTube in the comment section. Please let us know. Also, remember, you can now find Locked On Sports Minnesota on Amazon Fire and Roku. Just download the Locked On Sports Minnesota app to get all your favorite shows. And also, if you want endless Vikings talk, make sure you subscribe to the free Locked On Sports Minnesota YouTube channel where you can find all of our videos, all of our shows, instant podcasts after every game, and the Vikings press conferences delivering all the biggest news because this offseason is still going to go. They got to sign some players. They got to cut some players. They got to pick up some players. And so every time they break that down, and they got to pick a defensive coordinator. So as they break that down, we're going to be there with you this every step of the way. Like our videos and leave your thoughts in the comment section below. I want to thank you. Have a great day.